Hello, I'm Yvonne Schwab, ACG um, Silicon Valley CEO. We are excited to welcome you today to our virtual event on Web 3.0 AI and the corporate metaverse, how to gain real value. If you are new to ACGSV, we are the leading business-to-business -business networking organization in Silicon Valley, providing connections, thought leadership, and enabling personal and organizational growth. With nine different circles focused on different industries and interests, ACGSV offers an array of networking opportunities. And with over 14,000 members and 59 chapters across the world, ACG provides local connections with a global reach. Now, before I begin, I just wanted to point you quickly to our website for all of our upcoming events. So please visit us at acgsv.org. Now let's get started. I would like to introduce you to our moderator today, Jennifer Vessels, founder of Next Step, as well as the Executive Growth Alliance, which is a global community of um, F200 future ready leaders taking action for success in the future of work, Web 3.0, the metaverse, and innovation ecosystems. Please enjoy. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. It is wonderful, wonderful to be here to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is technology and people and how they can come together to help business leaders and their organizations grow and change. And I've had the honor over the last years to work with some of the world's largest companies, ranging from Adobe and Cisco in the technology world to Schneider Electric, airport authorities, and others around business models, transformative, transformative leadership, and what technology can mean for their business. In today's session, we will be exploring some of the latest technologies, ranging from the metaverse, i.e. Web3, a new arena built in a parallel universe kind of mentality that can allow people around the globe to easily, safely, securely, and privately without sharing your data, communicate with and work with others. It will allow you to be able to purchase items, to build value, to build companies together in a safe, secure, unique way. And we'll talk a bit more today about what that really means and where it fits. Just in the time that we've been planning this session over the last two months, the latest big wave of technology, ChatGPT from OpenAI.com, has really hit a huge wave and, and grown to 10, mil, 10 million users per day, daily visits and users. So we will also delve into what is chat GPT, what is AI, how does that blend with this metaverse and Web3, and explore some areas in which companies are actually already using these technologies to build their business into a future ready state for more growth in the new year as we go forward. I am joined by a panel of experts coming at this topic in a number of different ways. We have Shaheen Khan, who is a research analyst, technology drill down expert that we will hear from. We have Bal Horo, who is a hands-on applied technology expert with much experience in building companies, entrepreneurship, using the technology to drive change across various industries. And because the world of the future is not all about technology, it's about us as people and how we use technology and can leverage it in our daily lives and our work. We're very honored to have David Swanson, a multi-company, multi multi-view leader of people, leadership, human resources, and author of a very valuable book on data and technology and what that means for people. So as we kick off, I would love to start with a question and have each of our panelists introduce themselves while answering our first question, which is, what does this stuff really mean? To you, in your view, based on your research, Shaheen, based on your applications, Ball, and your view, David, as a humanist, 
but what does this really mean? And that can be metaverse, AI, what is it and how is it important? Shaheen, why don't you start us off from the academic, if you will, view? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's my sweet spot. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, ACG. Thank you all for being here. This is such a treat for me. Uh, so when we look at this, we think we are at the dawn of the digital revolution, the information revolution. The last time this revolution, where we uh, used uh, mechanical and then electromechanical systems to uh, become stronger physically. It was all about muscle. It was all about physical life, atoms, muscle. The analog universe was getting something that we could gain more control on. With the advent of digital revolution, we are now looking at virtual and bits instead of atoms. And now we're trying to become intelligent. So it is really the intelligence that is becoming computable, so to say. Now, the, 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 so really the fundamental shift is to build a digital universe that mimics the analog universe in, in, as accurately as it can and actually adds value in ways that the analog universe may not. Uh, this has already been happening in the world of supercomputing and academic computational simulation. For example, the you know, aerospace companies don't do as much wind tunnels as they did before because they can simulate it inside computers. Auto companies do crash simulation that is all inside computers. The photos of new cars that you see are probably computer generated. They're not the actual car. So a lot of that has been going on. What is really happening now is can I make it more immersive? Can I make it more of a, an environment where people can transact and have identities and all that? So the benefit of digital is that it's programmable, it's optimizable, it's specializable. And then that leads to sort of how am I gonna build this? So at the bottom layer, you want realistic description. You want data, and that means the semantics of data, the ontology of data. Internet of Things is going to be the fountain of data. On top of that, you'd like realistic force behavior. If I push it this way, where does it go? And that means physics-based simulations, deductive logic, inductive logic, mathematical models. On top of that, you need identity, self-sovereign identity, decentralized identity, and that kind of alludes to crypto. On top of that, you have value for transactions, and then you want kind of, again, low cost microtransactions all the way to really large transactions that are fast, better, faster, cheaper. Uh, you need policy, you need smart contracts, you need governance. All of those are starting to be built. So now really the question as you posed is what is actually real? So it's kind of happening slowly with gaming, with wellness, whether it's physical or mental. Uh, moving on to maybe automation of the stuff that we don't want to do, and then it goes from there. So I pause here and let's let's move to the applications where where all of the stuff is going to be built on. Like building a whole new parallel universe, indeed, from the ground up with all of these different layers. Excellent. So Bal, help us to understand where you see it going in in your applied environment and your clients. Absolutely. So I would like to thank uh, thanks ACG and thanks Jennifer for inviting me here. It's a uh, it's a it's amazing to see how the transformation is happening all around us with uh, Web three. Now there are a lot of uh, terms which are always coming in the tech industry: Web three, blockchain, uh, Chat GPT. But what all these things mean when it comes to business, when it comes to actual applications, is very important to understand uh, from a commerce perspective, right? So how do I use it as an individual, as a company, and as a employee, as somebody uh, who wants to generate money out of this? So uh, Web 3.0, e, Web, Web Metaverse, AI, these are these are transformations for solving the existing problems. What does existing problems do we have? The problems we have in the current web is the ownership of the content we generate. Uh, the AIs, as Shaheen rightly pointed, we are trying to change the and add uh, providing machines more capabilities, which uh, they didn't have. They, the industrial revolution was providing more muscle power to, to machines. Now we are providing more intelligence to machines 
so they can further automate uh, the human capabilities and be more generative and more, make humans more effective in and efficient in generating uh, and uh, and provide us more effectiveness in in our manufacturing processes what blockchain is providing is providing consistency across transactions and security across transactions so each of these innovations what we are trying to do the they are trying to be they are trying to change the application of existing technologies right and what uh, we are seeing in the application purpose of web 3.0 is uh, in a consumer market uh, there are companies like facebook and social media companies who are using this for transforming ways they are going to make their consumer products uh, more friendlier more uh, adaptable to the consumers to own their content to share their content to create new virtual realities for their users where they can live in. Whereas for companies, this will create a whole plethora of new innovations, which will allow them to create their products using uh, using virtual realities. For an instance, uh, we are working with a healthcare manufacturing company who builds their prosthetics using, uh, using virtual reality, which we today call as metaverse, uh, which helps them quickly analyze uh, in a real 3D model how that prosthetic would fit in in, in a human body. Uh, use blockchain to uh, track the entire end-to-end -end supply chain of those parts which are used in the prosthetic manufacturing. And then also use AI to quickly understand the different models which are needed to adapt to that particular prosthetics. So the same techniques which maybe Facebook is using uh, in providing consumer-based products for building their metaverse is can be used in the enterprise space for users to build their products. And as an individual tomorrow, you can create your own metaverse and build your own uh, you know, video production, your uh, webinars, using metaverse going forward there will be products where you can create your own metaverse to host your own chat rooms to host create your own contents and create your own uh, home supply chain so what this whole technology is leading towards is solving your existing problems with a more uh, more advanced ways of doing things so what we are seeing is the change and the ground shift in the ways uh, ways the current technologies are being implemented and the way they need to be evolving. Um, and the major concern what people have is if these things are changing, how the policy change will happen? Because we have been seeing for last 20 years that even if the the new technology has changed, the policy has never been changed with the government. And there have been cases of a lot of uh, personal information being used. There have been cases where there were data theft and there have been challenges of targeting of individuals. So my major concern would be the technology progresses. How would policy changes happen over time? Um, and then how would that affect uh, people in the at the end of this particular, you know, not end, but as this particular technology changes. So people are center, right, left, and center of this technology innovation. And we need to start thinking this from a perspective of people first and uh, surround ourselves by understanding how this affects people uh, while everybody's thinking about technology. So one of the themes I'm hearing from both of you is this concept of a parallel universe or almost as, as you're describing, Gal, well, this is a way of solving problems and trying things, simulating what would happen if I use this drug on this kind of person. It's almost like it's a, a sandbox or a, a, an experiment place in, in some ways. I'm sure there's lots of other applications, but a way that you can, can try different things in a lot of different arenas and and gain insight. I'm I'm also hearing that by it being built on a 
a different infrastructure where through cryptography, we would each have our own individual identity, our sovereign identity. So unlike today, when we go into an application and we have to remember our password or we default to saying, log me in with Google or Facebook, we know they're going to take everything that we do while we're in there and, and copy it. So under this, this new Web3, we would have our own identity that we don't share with a Facebook or a Google. We go in through some backend smart way of validating it's really us. You actually so we can own. transact and play. So you, if going forward, if the, the photo you shared on Facebook or Instagram, you will own it. Instead of logging into Facebook, what you will do, you can share everything on Facebook, share everything on Instagram, but the photo you share is encrypted with your key. Uh, you People can see it, but they cannot claim it is there. Ah. Imagine a world where everything you put on internet, you, you nobody else can claim it because it has been encrypted by your key. Mm -hmm. So it's not only about the identity for logging in, but it's about identity of owning it. Mm -hmm. Today, you go on Quora and answer it, answer a question. It just shows that, okay, Jennifer answered this question, but Quora can go in the back and delete your user and make you irrelevant because Quora owns that content. You don't own that content. But mm -hmm. in Web 3.0 world, what the, 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 cha the, the change we are trying to drive is when Jennifer goes and puts a content out there, Jennifer puts that content with the encryption key of hers. And now Jennifer owns that content. If Jennifer has to take it out, Jennifer has to come there, provide her key and take that content out. So everything what you will generate on Web 3.0 is going to be using your identity key and you Got own it. it. No, but not the website owner. Got it. So, so a I big piece of this Sorry, so the, a big piece of this is digital rights management. Mm -hmm. Who owns what and how are transactions governed today and tomorrow? Whether these transactions are pre-governed or governed as you go, all of those mm -hmm. are variations. The other thing I wanted to say is that the, the, the metaverse, the universe, the digital twin, whatever you want to call it, at the end is going to be a blend of physical and digital. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is it is not quite parallel as much as it's interweaves and entangles, right? Interesting, interesting. So and through this this sovereign digital rights ownership, if I want to try something out, I can go in and try it out and and if it works, then it's still mine. I don't have to worry about other people saw it and can take it. Correct. Well, I think that's going to be subject to the contract that governs your use of somebody's capabilities with your data. Got so it. what happens to that derivative IP? You know, how much of it Got do it. you own? How much of it do they own? What kind of, a, what transaction are you gonna make going forward? All of those need to be worked out. The legal framework for it needs to be worked out. People need to learn to read the fine print or have standard agreements that everybody understands after a while. All of that continues to be a bit of a complexity right now. And that is where the third innovation or DAO comes in, right? DAO, where the mm -hmm. organizations are governed by the AI rule engine, right? So if you if you today the organizations are governed by a by a chief executive officer or a board, uh, and that is where the concept of uh, DAO comes in, where the organization is governed by set of rules. Uh, and AI, which is going to decide based on those rules um, and the principles which are set forward and the decisions will be based on the principles which are set and the AI will decide based on that. And that's that's preliminarily what DAO means. And that will form the legal form, uh, I would say legal basis for transacting with that ownership of the content, what that DAO would bring. So all these layers of uh, complexity of policy making of ownership uh, have been thought through in web 3.0 one after another uh, based on how would a content be generated who will be owning it how will the rights be shared uh, and there are level, different levels of complexity into it uh, and but what we are essentially trying to solve is the multi-layered problem as we have in our current system 
in Web 2.0, where people generate content, people share content, and no, and the the website hosters own the content, uh, <laughs> whereas the people person who generates it never owns it. Right. Um, and the what has happened is, I have generated a bunch of content for all of these websites, and they are using that to train their AI models, and uh, chat gpt which of course spent billions of dollars training their model has used all of these uh content generated by millions and billions of users to train their model and got 20 billion dollars from microsoft on the content generated by all of these people right even if they have built the model but the data set which they were trained on was generated by a lot of people which who got nothing this is just an example but nothing against chat gpt but the point here is nobody, AI models are getting trained on content generated by people and those people don't get anything. So that's the, those are some fundamental problems in today's world, which Web 3.0 is trying to change. So we, this all should be very, very good for people because it allows us to uh, have ownership, to not feel as though we're being taken advantage of and to be able to, to use this extra muscle to, to go forward in a new new world. So I'm curious, David, what, what are you hearing from, from people in your role of a, a leader of HR? Is everyone excited and embracing this? Yeah, it's it, Jennifer, it, it's mixed. And, and again, you know, thanks to ACG for pulling this together and all the work that you've done, Jennifer. It's been uh, it's been humbling as I've listened to Shaheen and Val. Uh, they're obviously much more steeped in the technology than this than I am. But the topic we just talked about of ownership, it, it's absolutely critical to the workplace today. So with the, you know, the advent of work from home, this advent of you know, freelance work, the meaning of an employee has changed dramatically. What it means to go to work has changed dramatically. What it means to get a paycheck has changed dramatically. But today, to Ball's point and, and Shaheen's point, that data is not owned by those individuals. So the lines between an employee and an employer, they used to be quite bright. The thinking was, look, if you develop this while you are an employee of us, we own it. And, uh, and today, you know, people who are not employees are getting access to very precious, very proprietary information from their, the organizations they're supporting and their customers. And if there's a way to make it clear who really owns that, I think that has huge advantage for individuals who are entering the workforce um, you know, not as a, a traditional employee, but from an organizational level, you know, we've read all of the layoffs that have been hitting. It seems like every day somebody new is talking about laying off 5% of their workforce. And at the basis of that, <clears throat> beyond, frankly, bad decisions made by the executives in terms of hiring too many people, is this idea of efficiency. In, in the world of people and human resources and people analytics, um, the, the inefficiency is just unbelievably abundant. There are you know, repetitions of work being done by the same people in the same organization. They have no idea what each other are doing. Um, organizations and, and the organization that I most recently worked for, you know, had <clears throat> several thousand people that did nothing but answer human resources questions for employees. I want to change my beneficiary. I don't understand where my W-2 is if I'm a U.S.-based employee. And that all gets answered in many ways by a person. And so a number of organizations are figuring out how to leverage some of this technology to be able to get people information in a way that's accurate and timely <clears throat> and not have to have so many people involved in that. But beyond that, from an individual perspective, you know, the real question here is, you know, is privacy. So we've had a lot of assurances over time. Um, you know, from people, you know, Zuckerberg has talked about, you know, we're going to design everything with safety in mind. Well, you know, at the end of the day, they're going to design things with revenue in mind. I mean, that, that's why companies exist. Companies exist to make money. Companies exist to, you know, to sustain themselves. And while they say all kinds of nice things about their employees and their customers and their partners, the fact is that's the bottom line. And so I think the real value here is, one, how do you free people up to do the work that really makes a difference, to do the discretionary work, not the routine work, in a way that you know, I think that the internet has been promising for years and not delivered. Software companies have been promising for years and not delivered. 
you know, this idea that, you know, software is going to make your life easier has just really not come to fruition. And, and I worked for a big software company for SAP mm -hmm. and Success Factors. And, you know, I'd go out on sales calls and I would listen to the salespeople say, hey, this is going to make your employees' life easier. And then you talk to the employees a year later and they go, wow, this is super complicated. <laughs> this is, if anything, we've had to add people to be able to make this work. I think this has the opportunity and the leverage to fundamentally change that equation where people really can start to focus on the things that make a difference. We were talking in one of our earlier meetings, you know, what if you could actually you know, not so much write or do things for people? Um, this, there was a reference to, you know, universities now are looking into uh, chat GPT. Is it, is it a way for students to be able to write uh, papers that they haven't authored? And, you know, there was a professor, I think from Stanford that said, look, that's been going on for a hundred years. You know, the, the challenge for professors is to really tell what what's really the body of work of that student and did what they produce actually equate to something they can do. And so that's sort of the negative side. But the positive side is what if it actually generated ideas you'd never thought of? So it takes this idea of brainstorming, which, by the way, brainstorming can be a really negative process because it often only amplifies the largest and loudest voice in the room. And it can actually generate ideas that, that even a team of people wouldn't have thought of. So it has the capability, I think, to open up solutions in ways we've never seen before. It also has the capability to hopefully, as you know, as best we can, start to move bias out of decisions. So the organizations that I'm familiar with that are using this the whole metaverse web 3.0 are starting to use it in two areas. One is in talent acquisition. So how do we go find those people that we need to do the job? Not the people who have the right degree or the people who've worked for the right companies, mm -hmm. but the people who've actually done fundamentally different work that's going to add value. And maybe we don't hire them full time. Maybe we bring them as a consultant. But how do mm -hmm. we you know, parse through the thousands of people who are banging on us for opportunities and be able to separate those two out? The other big area, and we're seeing this with a couple of the large consulting firms, uh, this idea of onboarding employees, how do you get employees productive faster so that they can become valuable and helpful to their customers, create new ideas, get to market faster? Well, you used to bring them into the office and you'd have these week long, three week long sessions on orientation. Well, that just doesn't work anymore. So some of these companies are experiencing with ways to create a virtual office where people don't come, but they still get a feel for what the organization looks like and feels like and how people act. And I think that's that's an area that has a lot of potential to help you know, get people steeped in the culture and the way of business being done within that organization, which in the end is really the, the technology advantage that organizations have. Obviously, you know, smart companies have really good algorithms to create great products, but in the end, it's people. It's people who come up with the innovative ideas, who provide exemplary customer support, who are really helping to drive the sustainability of the business. And that's where I think this has a huge opportunity to be a positive force. Interesting, and I'm reflecting back to a comment I think Shaheen made that this is all about immersive, not think about it, not look at it, not read it, but try it. So if I think about an organization trying to attract new talent, you know, what about having them come today in our virtual environment, see what it's like, interact with other people. And then that that learning from wherever you are, you can can learn, you can role play, you can experiment. That that sounds very very positive. Yeah, I mean the, the great uh, Clayton Christensen, he, you know his book Innovator's Dilemma. It's it's this idea you don't know what you don't know, and you know you can only go as far as your book of experience. There are a few people who have really the capability of, of taking a vision to the next level. Those people are few and far between in my mm -hmm. 30 plus years of experience. Mm -hmm. Most people work off of the book of experience that they have. So this has the opportunity to really open that up in ways that people wouldn't have thought of before. Mm -hmm. Try yeah. something different. Right. Jane, unmute. Yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah. One, one way to look at this is that think about the universe of algorithms that exist total. You could kind of create a Venn diagram in there that says, you know, there's you put a circle around all the algorithms that are tractable, understandable for humans. The, 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 the assertion, the theory is that there are algorithms that are outside of that set that are accessible and tractable by computers, but not by humans. Yes. And if you think of it that way, well, then AI will net expand the range of capabilities that humans can do that they otherwise could not do. Now, the challenge is whether those extra algorithms that are not understandable by us are going to serve us or going to hurt us. And that's where the Darwinian mistake comes in. 
Mm-hmm. And 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 that's the, you know then that's the challenge that I hope humanity will manage properly. Yeah. So with Chat GPT, you could go into it and say, "Find me an algorithm that I don't have access to that would allow me to explore what it would be like to be a surfer in Tahiti." And yeah. <laughs> then suddenly I'm transported into this uh, VR world and I'm surfing. Yeah. Well, yeah, actually, yeah, we're a little far from that, but though, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're all far from that. But actually, along those lines, you know, I, I believe the proper operative assumption is that eventually AI will be better at everything. So, what does the world look like when AI is better than humans at everything? Like when they started being better than us in muscles, we did not have a problem with that. We enjoyed that. In fact, we had given that up to animals before then. You know, we knew a cow can plow better than I can, right? So I had no fantasy of competing with that. I had no fantasy of competing with a cheetah in speed, right? I have no fantasy of competing with an airplane in speed. I know it's faster and I enjoy it. But now there's a machine that's smarter than I am or better than I am in, you know, at least one thing that I do, if not more things and eventually everything. So in a world like that, what does it mean to be a human? What does it mean to be so, a person? You know, must we continue to look for areas where we are better than machines? Or is that a futile attempt? So Shine, I think we also agreed that computers are better than us than remem- for in remembering and calculating faster than us. What well, the sure. problem sure. is when computers started generating better than us, that is yeah. the problem. When they started generating better than us, that is the problem where the problem started because now the computers can do things which can replace me. Uh, but the, the, way just I look at it, <laughs> the way I look at it and the viewpoint I want to change is generation is just the one task uh, which computer does. Generation is not the core task. The core task for human is the ingenuity of the idea. Till now, it is unproven that AI can come out with an idea. Mm -hmm. The inception, as we call it, the inception of the thought, consciousness, is not something which AI can have or has not been yet proven to have, right? So still AI needs, even the best generative AI needs, a a training data set, right? Mm -hmm. So all Mm -hmm. the algorithms we are trying to talk about, all the possible algorithms in the universe you might have, they all limit to the existing information you have, not all possible data set, which is out of the information which you don't have. So if if there are possibilities outside the information which is already produced, which only humans can generate. So there is a huge data set out there, which humans are going to generate, which is where our, the new generation should focus on, uh, on reskilling themselves and focusing on what, if machines are trying to solve the problems or of all the data sets, what we already have, why don't we focus on solving the problems which we have not even thought of before? And that's the next, next wave of, uh, education we should be thinking about that's the next wave of uh, retalenting ourselves we should be thinking about so there should be fundamental change in our schools our colleges our education system of we have been learning how to do things the same way for almost 100 years now what we can do to change education system to think about uh, solving problems beyond uh, you know normal capability which now machines can do and reskill the new generation about thinking problems which machine ca- cannot can not do yet or may not be able to do in next 50 or 100 years interesting david any comments from you on on this question of as the machines get stronger and and take more control over the how to get it done what what you're seeing people to to think about the role of humanity. Is it that think of the new problems, look ahead, or is there another role? Yeah, I th- you know, I think the, um, 
the promise of technology has always been, you know, to, to free people up. Um, there's also been, you know, the, the long-standing story that, you know, some computer is going to take your job next year. And I think to, to Bala Shaheen's point, you know, there's still a piece that requires human intervention. And there's still a piece that, that can benefit from human intervention. The challenge, and, and there's already quite a few articles on this now, is does Web 3.0 uh, continue to fuel the digital divide. Um, I think when we live here in the heart of technology in the world, and we often assume that everybody spends all day, you know, on a computer, on a tablet, on a smartphone. Um, but, you know, we all have uh, access to data in a in an unfettered and completely um, uh, you know wide open way. But the reality is, there's a large portion of the world who don't have that kind of access, and so. To me, the challenge of this is, is it can it provide access to those people in ways that don't require them to be in a place that has high speed Internet or a place where they have the latest technology to access? Um, can it provide them the same level of opportunity? Because I, I think the, the world's problems are going to be solved by people who aren't you know, in the news today. They're going to be people sitting in the middle of Africa who have an idea for something or they're sitting in the heart of uh, some place in South America, but nobody knows because there's no way for them to easily connect. And that's, I think, to me, that's the real benefit here is that can we unleash the power of everyone uh, at some level to have access to provide their input, to provide their insights and their wisdom, which just really doesn't exist today. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm seeing that the opportunity for those of us uh... That, that are in Silicon Valley and other places and start asking why and start reaching out and maybe embracing those that, that are not in the front and center and, and asking them why and getting their perspectives and getting them involved in, in the dialogue. Um, but that kind of touches back to uh, one of the things that, that's come up in our discussion, which is policies and governance and standards. I mean, this, this all sounds a little bit like uh, the Wild West and uh, anybody is trying anything and and certainly Meta, i.e. Facebook, is promoting that, well, we created it, we own it. Um, I, I'm curious and we'll just kind of again go around from Shaheen, Duvall and David of what, what are you seeing on the standards? And it, as we do that, I'll just comment for our participants. Uh, if you have questions, things that you want to bring to the table, Please put them in the chat and um, between Yvonne and ourselves, we'll be monitoring that chat and very open to other things that you want to talk about. So Shaheen, what, what do you yeah. feel on these standards questions? So I think part of the challenge is that we live at a time when there are several really important trends going on at the same time. It's mm -hmm. not just one, but there's an avalanche of a half a dozen more, right? From from robotics to you know digital biology to you know how do we deal with pandemics and look how great we actually handle that in reality right to uh, internet of things to quantum computing fusion ai uh, robot you know I, on and on there's like a, a, you know crypto hpc supercomputing uh, you know gpus you know like a cambrian explosion of all of these technologies that are coming so really a challenge for any organization let alone individuals is how do you get your arms around all of this now imagine you're a politician right so you're totally at the mercy of whatever staff you happen to get who are going to go do the staff work and bring to you crystallization of all of these things and then for you to synthesize that you need to have like an ethical framework at the same time before we can really have a legal framework. So by necessity, really, we're going to lag the technology. And when you lag the technology with your regulations and kind of norms of the society, mm -hmm. you're liable to make mistakes. And hopefully those mistakes will not be irreversible. Hopefully those mistakes will not be sort of the singularity events that people talk about. There won't be a Darwinian mistake. We will not, you know, and, and while we're doing all of that, we have to deal with climate change. We have to do with pandemics. We have to do with, you know, nuclear threats and all these mega threats that are remnants of industrial revolution that we have to do. So I think the assignment is extremely challenging. Unfortunately, I'm really not observing now. I, you know, it's not like they would let me know, but, but I'm not observing 
politicians really being on this. I think, mm -hmm. you know, Europe is doing a really good job, admirable job on data privacy. GDPR is a really good step. And some countries are really taking it seriously. Some other countries are actually taking advantage of lack of data privacy by advancing their AI rapidly. And, and you know, who knows? Do they, do they have it right? Is this really what we should be doing right now? Mm -hmm. These are really good questions that I'm not really seeing sufficient debates about. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So we are in a wild west. But the question is allowing this to, to slowly come together. Maybe some politicians are asking chat GPT right now, what should I do on this topic? And uh, allowing and it to uh, co-create with us. What do I need to do to get reelected next term? <laughs> <laughs> well, well you know, thoughts? speaking of that, have you seen the recent deep fakes? I think the political landscape will never be the same again because they now have videos of a politician saying all the things that they never would have said with the same accent, with the same voice. So that's kind of the dark side of metaverse and AI and, and, and the technology. Very good point. Well, yeah. So uh, I think, sorry, can you please uh, come back to the question again? I was uh, <laughs> so, so intrigued in thinking what, about what is... What is your perspective on policy and standards? Where are we in uh, in really getting some structure around this? Absolutely. So I think we are far behind. We are three decades behind the policy. We currently, mm -hmm. as as United States, we currently don't have policies for Web 2.0. Uh, and Web 3.0 is, is far, far in the future from the policy standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what I would I would say, yes, Europe has done a commendable job in GDPR. Uh, and then Australia is again on a good path of thinking about their, uh, you know, their privacy policies. Uh, but I think it is very important for, um, for a democracy to operate and lead uh, it's it's uh, you know its population with the right kind of protection from uh, and to make, keep the capitalism and the economy growing and keep them protected from the harms of um, aggressive uh, aggressive exploitation with the right kind of policies. So I would. Uh, I would be very concerned if the technology on one hand keeps on growing at an exponential rate without uh, anybody looking at the policy decisions. So uh, it's very important that we let the markets be open and free and have everybody uh, build that technology and not stop human ingenu ingenuity to build technology and have open ideas. But at the same time, we have to have uh, government looking into what are the ill effects of this technology and how do we build policies to protect uh, mm -hmm. protect the people and provide right kind of governance framework. Uh, I, I'm not an expert in policy making. I'm not an expert in even uh, thinking about the framework for that. Uh, but I would I would be very much concerned if nobody's thinking about it. Right. Uh, what I am very good at is thinking about technology, thinking about innovation, how to take that and build next new product. Uh, but if somebody comes to me and says, hey, by the way, this product might have this effect, I can think differently to protect uh, the mm -hmm. user of that in a way. So uh, I think uh, we currently do not have the right guidance from a lot of, because we day in, day out work with a lot of uh, policymakers in the company as well as uh, work with the uh, with the local governments as well as federal from compliance perspective and uh, we can clearly see the current uh, current control policies current norms we have are so basic from uh, protection of uh, protection of individuals is that there are scripted rules which can be just uh, you know there are script playbooks which can be followed through and uh, we can get them approved within months. And uh, we don't really have to do a lot to think about, think out of the box to build uh, a very strong foundation for the technology to 
really protect the end um, end consumer of a product. So I think this has to change uh, dramatically uh, if we mm-hmm. are going into a new era with AI and Web 3.0, which are quite powerful technologies um, mm-hmm. to begin with. So uh, for me, it's a concern, uh, but I currently cannot offer any solution for that, uh, for sure. In in light of uh, the couple of questions from from Nancy here, I mean, I, I would love to love to hear from from all three of you on the what you see today as the top security risk. Considering we don't have these standards, and then I'd love to hear, especially from Shaheen, based on his uh, his comment earlier on starting with an ethical framework, which makes sense to me. I mean, what is an ethical framework? So so. Whatever order we want to jump in here. Sure. I can take the ethical one. I think the ethical framework is a is a question of your values, of course, mm-hmm. and whether those values and whether you have sufficient strength to enforce those values. So it becomes basically a tug of war between values and vulnerability, if you mm-hmm. will. Right? And different societies answer that differently based on how strongly they are committed to those values, uh, how easily they might compromise them, mm-hmm. and whether they have enough of a, you know, uh, stick, so to say, that, uh, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick, uh, if you have a big enough stick to be able to enforce it and protect it. Now, the problem what we have with, 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 with a lot of these technologies, from quantum computing to fusion energy to AI to whatnot, is that we don't understand them quite well yet. We don't know what sort of implications they're going to have two years, five years, 10 years from now. So at the end of the day, we're gonna have to make some bets that are going to hopefully pan out. And while we do that, it behooves us to maintain a level of strength that allows us to defend against any mistakes. And that is also challenging. So those would be the avenues I would use to go around it. There are several centers around the world that are studying the ethical impact of AI. I think I'm familiar with one at Carnegie Mellon, but there are many others that are very, very encouraging and very necessary. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing that 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 ethical framework would start with understanding what are what are the values that you have as a as an entity, whether it's an organization, a person or a, a government. What what's most important and then understand what are the trade offs with each of the different technologies in order to then say, these are the areas that we want to make sure we make available. These are the areas we want to condense. So without that today, what do each of you see as as a security risk? What could go wrong if we all jump in and start creating simulations and avatars and buying NFTs and all this stuff? So clearly from a people perspective, it's access to some of the most precious data that you have. It's your medical history. It's who mm-hmm. you associate with. What do you spend time doing when you're on the internet? Um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that can be used in all kinds of nefarious ways uh, from barring people employment to um, you know, holding people back in terms of promotions, discriminating against people. You know, there's all kinds of, of negative implications. And Unfortunately, if, if we leave it to governments, I mean, governments are really sovereign geographies. They can't, it's hard for governments to solve world problems. And these are world issues and world problems. And so, you know, do we leave it in the hands of the, the commercially motivated organizations? Uh, mm-hmm. you know, many have very broad global reach. Uh, I think it has to be a combination of both because it has to be, you know, this, this idea of who has the stick, because at the end, there has to be consequences for bad behavior. Uh, Mm -hmm. So who enforces that? That probably has to be governments or some kind of governmentally driven organization. But but in the end, you know, employees have to take that responsibility as well for their data. You know, it always amazes me when people say, well, you know, I I don't do this and I don't do that. It's like, well, you're holding a smartphone in your hand and Google's tracking everything you're doing or Apple's tracking everything you're doing. And you know, I used to tell people, look, if, if somebody wants to get that Im- information bad enough, it's out there somewhere on a server. And it used to come up oftentimes when you were doing investigations on harassment and people would say, well, you can't prove anything. It's like, if I have enough money and time, I can prove a lot of things. <laughs> and, and I can tell a lot of things you've been doing that you think you've been deleting in terms of a digital trail, but that digital trail never goes away. 
Uh, so, you know, so the question is here, can we use this for the good or, you know, are there, are there nefarious players out there? And yes, there are. And what are they, what's our capability to lessen those? Because they'll never go away uh, and provide some consequence for that kind of bad behavior. Mm -hmm. That's an open question. Yeah, that's fair. Well, I think along like those lines, I think along those lines, you need new social norms right. that recognize that certain things are okay now because they are simply uh, impossible to do any other way. Right. And and as, as 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 David was saying, it's a you know we call it a digital tattoo. It, mm -hmm. it you you can't get rid of it even if you try. Right? Yeah. So, so we the, each need an ethical framework of how far we're willing to go and what we're willing to trade off. But well, please. <laughs> Absolutely, one of the biggest problem is we have to assume there will be uh, there will be bad players, right? So for example. Uh, we are very comfortably saying that I will own the content uh, on, say, Twitter or Instagram or what, wherever I'm going to post, right? So let's take a simple example. If I post something, I own it, and I can control the content which I have been posting. But I can post a nefarious content, and I own it. Mm -hmm. The website owner doesn't own it. So they cannot control, technically, if I, if I can delete it or not. They can hide it. They can stop it but they can control it. So there are mm -hmm. some, some, uh, some aspects of uh, control issues which come into picture when you allow people to own their content, right? So there are areas of Web 3.0 uh, which with the digital rights management can, uh, with the digital rights framework, uh, can provide loopholes for somebody who are going to be using this technology uh, in to affect large audiences, to affect uh, people in a, in a negative way. Uh, so an ethical framework, again, is a very broader term, I would say, uh, to, for me to talk about. But there has to be a, a mechanism, a security mechanism for Web 3.0 thought through differently uh, for, uh, for I would say, an implementation framework from ground up, which have not been thought through. So it has to be a standard across Web 3.0 that how would you handle content which uh, has been uh, shared for purpose uh, of not, be, not, uh, not creating any value, positive value for the society, right? Mm -hmm. So there has to be thought the in the Web 3.0 proposal itself, uh, there has not been any thought about all the learnings we have from 2.0, uh, about all the challenges we have, uh, where all the players have played in 2.0, about all the nefarious use cases of, you know, dark web, uh, people sharing things and abusing, uh, you know, over the internet, as well as the bullying which happened over Twitter, etc. How do we solve them in 3.0 has not been thought through. So that can form the part of ethical framework for 3.0, uh, which I think is a big area, which is work in progress and has mm -hmm. not been thought through yet. And a uh, lot of contributors can play. I think uh, Web 3.0 has been commercially thought through a lot, but not from an ethical perspective yet. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think the four, one security risk is compromising compromising your identity. Uh, currently, blockchain is very sparsely used. Uh, not many people are using it. So today, we don't know if uh, that cryptography is secured enough. Um, and in the in the advance with the advancement of quantum computing, uh, any cryptographic, none of the cryptographic framework is secured enough with if quantum computing becomes real in next couple of years, every cryptographic framework can be broken because quantum computing can literally break any cryptography, uh, which is active today. Uh, it has that power of computing, right? And then- but Today, one of the challenges is literally the compute power to allow for anyone to have access to the cryptography to really right. give that sovereign identity. Yes, and as soon as quantum computing gets real, uh, which is not yet, but it gets real. Uh, cryptography is of the past. Means cryptography can be even RSA two zero four. It cannot stand quantum computing. Within a couple of minutes, it can break uh, RSA. Means it's 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 uh, 
it's a mathemat it's a 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 problem for quantum computing it's, it's the simplest problem it can solve so it's not too hard to for quantum computer to solve so the second problem is uh how who who generates uh these tokens who generates this who owns this right so mm -hmm. it is a decentralized system but somebody has to be the generator and owner of it so again the problem of ownership and commercial value comes into picture so that's mm -hmm. another security and intent risk uh, and third risk i would say is uh, a widespread implementation of these systems of web 3.0 uh, would would also mean is the governance across borders. So yet uh, mm -hmm. humanity thinks the world in in thought of borders. Yet we have not understood mm -hmm. that we are we have a single earth in this expanse of universe where there is not a single living living intelligent life we have still yet found after James Webb telescope yet. So there is nothing out there, but still we uh, see borders, but if we are thinking about borders across different uh, countries, how about all this content and ownership of patents and all the trademarks? Uh, how does that work? Has not been thought through. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a more of a, a control from the perspective, not a security issue, but a control pro control problem from the borders perspective, uh, mm -hmm. with with uh, with the content and rights management. So that these are the three security problems, uh, which Web 3.0 and uh, all of these ecosystem is yet struggling with, and that might be, uh, you know, that might be why a lot of metaverse related uh, implementation has slowed down recently. Mm -hmm. And that that I think addresses Emily's question that we may still be early on a lot of the underpinnings and those frameworks through which people will be more open and it probably will be safer to, to not only develop, but then for people to access the, the killer apps, if, if you will. So, so to answer I, Emily's question a little bit differently, one of the big major problem of metaverse is you have to generate the metaverse for somebody, right? So for, for a very long time, you have been, you have been game developers who were, who were developing all this virtual reality. Uh, and they were paid because people used to pay for subscription. Now, Metaverse, if Facebook is investing so much, so much of money in building this Metaverse and providing it for free, what is the revenue model? Ads cannot be the revenue model. So uh, until and unless AI can, the generative AI can really generate this automatically for Metaverse, uh, there is not going to be a real real killer app for metaverse is because that generation of metaverse has to be completely automated it cannot be human driven uh, if metaverse creation of metaverse is automated and not relied on humans uh, until then there won't be a switch of people using a lot of metaverse in consumer market of course there is a lot of enterprise market which uses it but a lot of consumer market the generation of metaverse has to be absolutely zero dollars for the companies to really invest into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would just add to that, that, that there have been applications that are now being relabeled metaverse. Yeah. And those have been around, like I said, you know, simulation of a manufacturing facility and recognizing that, oh, that table could come up one foot higher and it will help the, you know, the streamline, et cetera. So those things have been going on for a long time. And now because they are immersive graphics, because they've got computer generated visualization, and, and, and they have some relationships with physics-based simulations, those are eligible to be called metaverse and they are doing that. There's also gaming. Gaming by definition is immersive. You've got your, you know, you know goggles, like the small, you know, even without a goggles, you're like totally immersed in a game. And, and within a game, you can buy things, you can sell things, you can accumulate stuff, you can maintain stuff. So there's an in-app purchase, in-app transaction facility in there. Some of that can go to crypto, some of that doesn't have to. So gaming is eligible. Then there is kind of meditations when you are sort of in your own zone and, and, and you are immersive again. Or it could be physical health where you're exercising with somebody that is like, you know, so those are all being relabeled metaverse. Uh, but what we are really talking about is what Bal is talking about, where 
you're 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 really you're a little bit more than that. You really have a whole environment, not just a particular application. Yeah. Is it fair to say it's kind of two layers? That that metaverse layer is what's immersive, what's using some form of augmented reality or virtual reality, where it's it's kind of that that playground that that could be considered a metaverse. Whereas when you get down to the the Web three and the cryptography and the the sovereign identity and and the the digital rights management, that's kind of the underlying piece. So you could do something in Web three that's a metaverse, but you could do a metaverse that doesn't have to be built on the Web three, but is the yes. immersive side. Yes. Yep, that's right. That's right. You almost need like a level one, level two, level three. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> oh, and you can grow into more and more sophisticated environments. Yeah. Totally, totally. So I realize that that some people are probably needing to jump off. So I'd like to do just one quick lightning round, and then we will we will be here till the bottom of the hour for other questions. But I'd love to hear from each of our our panelists um, based on what what you know and what we've discussed here today. What do you recommend that that our listeners, our, our participants, what do you recommend people actually do to either explore, immerse into, get started with all this new uh, metaverse stuff? Who would like to go first? I'll go first. <laughs> so as I was saying up front, I see a lot of this stuff as a consequence of the digital transformation, digital revolution. So if digital transformation is important to you, then you obviously have to be on top of this and you have to, the first step is to really study it, to track it, to get on somebody like Val's calendar once a quarter for two hours and pick his brains and see where, and you know, and, and we all have that sort of a network. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really suggesting that you go like, you know, hire, you know, some, but, but take advantage of the network that you already have and, and be more, more directive directed about it rather than random about it right so mm -hmm. you keep up with the technology and there are again half a dozen technologies that you want to be conversant about you want to know enough to know what works and what doesn't work if digital transformation is not important to you you have to ask why not should it be uh, not everything in life needs to be digitized you can be successful without it however mm -hmm. the forefront of the future is going to necessarily be a blend of digital and, and, and analog, so it's a threat and an opportunity, right? So if it's an opportunity, grab it. If you don't grab it, can it be a threat? If you can be sure that it's not a threat because, hey, you know, I'm making peanut butter and it's gonna be peanut butter forever and life is good, or um, I have a pizza shop and the sauces, that's what it's all about. Okay, then maybe maybe you're fine. But but I think you have to make that decision. And And if you do, then you have to recognize the importance of data and the fact that data, just like atoms, is really hard. Data is hard. Uh, the correctness of it, the reproducibility of it, the validity of it, the completeness of it uh, are all over the map. And, and, and you know, one of the things we're learning in the digital world is that uh, like in, in information warfare, there was a time when information warfare was about, do I know what the other guy is planning? Right. Mm -hmm. But now it is, can I give the wrong coordinate to the missile while it's in flight so that it's delivered to the wrong address? Right. So it's the misinformation and it is, it is you know, compelling you to do the wrong thing to begin with by yourself without me even putting. So all of these are new areas that are data driven. So you have to understand the value of the data. And one mm -hmm. of the problems that we have in our existing, uh, you know, profitability model is that people give away their data for free, right? And, and, and is that a good idea? So all of those are questions that you really should be able to answer. Learn, learn about the technology, talk to people and think about what you put out there in your data and where it might add value, Paul? Absolutely, great Shane. And I, I would second what Shane said for sure. Think about data, right? Data is so essential uh so valuable and you are the one generating it and uh, think about it when you are giving it for free my personal uh, i would say rather than giving an advice what to do in this web 3.0 i would say what i do right so <laughs> <laughs> uh 
So the way I I immerse myself is by trying, right? So I I went out and I bought uh, VR headsets to try what how this metaverse experience looks like. Subscribed to these uh, events and subscribed to the services. Uh, I I personally like to be on the edge of technology and try to experience it myself. Uh, I subscribe to Web 3.0 services like. Uh, we had this um, uh, wonderful experience with uh, uh, um, what is it? Uh, the domains. Uh, what was the domain company? Unstoppable domains. Unstoppable domains. So actually, registered a couple of unstoppable domains and then uh, used a couple of Web 3.0 services. Uh, I started using Chat GPT as soon as it opened. So as soon as you hear new technological advancements, try and experience and try to figure out how you can use them in your daily life. And I try to figure out what, what work which I do every day or my team does every day mm -hmm. or my customers do every day can be offsetted by this new technology. Uh, so I see my time as this 24 hours a day uh, and the less work I do, more time I can spend thinking about other things I can do better. So mm -hmm. uh, I see technology as an enabler rather than uh, anything else. So uh, that's my perspective. And if you think this is what you uh, what you like, then I would suggest that you try to, to do the same thing. Uh, but I also think about data in the similar way what Shaheen was saying, that before giving up your data for free, um, please think about how much valuable your data is to yourself and um, and how much valuable it is to the company you are giving it to. So be careful sharing data to keep people uh, while you are doing this and make sure you are protected every time you are sharing this information in the public domain. Um, and uh, if you are a company and you're deciding about uh, changing and transforming your company, even if you are a, uh, you know, a, a tomato maker or Sorry, I forgot your example. But if you're a pizza maker, uh, you it, with the new advancements, there is a possibility that you will be replaced by an AI. So uh, think about it, how you can uh, use your data to build your AI. So mm -hmm. nobody else can replace you. So uh, just a very small story before, uh, before we go ahead. I was working with my gym trainer to build a database of um, of uh, what is the nutrition and and the health plan, the exercise plan or workout plans he's providing to all of his trainees, and what is the effect, uh, weight loss, mm -hmm. muscle gain, and etc. over last two years, right? In a very small data set, uh, and then uh, collecting all the demographic based on all different things. Uh, which is age and uh, you know ethnicity and all of that because you have different gene pools and everything uh, and all PII protected of course uh, and then we build this database database and purely on the statistics basis not even machine learning that's too advanced mm -hmm. uh, today purely on statistics basis we can figure out what works for what kind of human behavior right and he he. At this point in time, he is competing with a small pool in in Seattle against other training, uh, other gym training companies or uh, outfits out here with the, this small pool of data and providing results uh, much effectively, uh, optimizing their nutrition, their workout plans, helping them uh, reduce weight, gain weight, whatever their objectives are because of the data which he collected over the last two, three years. So data has immense value. And then he paid royalties to all of our gave discounts as part of the data collection mechanism to uh, mm -hmm. all the people he was working with, right? Um, so the data has immense value. Just think what you can do for your business by thinking about data in a different way, right? So uh, that that is what I would tell people that think about data a little differently and try to innovate uh, in your business, in your daily life, and it can uh, it can do wonders for everything what you do. We helped people build muscle 
based upon their data that he then compensated them back for, recognizing that their data was helping not only them, but others. And this muscle does not mean somebody wants to build muscular muscles. This, there was a 64-year-old gentleman who was having a huge shoulder pain. And he helped him get rid of the shoulder pain just by building that muscle at the age of 64. Just because if you build the right kind of, you know, right kind of shoulder muscle, you, your shoulder pain or freeze or what is it called, freezing shoulder goes away. So you can solve a lot of these issues just based on the data. And he didn't have to subscribe to any service, go to other things. Mm -hmm. It was based on the data which he already owned, right? So this Very small innovations can change a lot of things. I think the key here is to be curious, uh, not fearful, curious. Not, not indifferent. Mm -hmm. um, talk to your customers. If people are, are playing around with this already. Talk, you know, if you have a service provider, you know, in the HR arena, if you have an HR um, uh, operations organization, they're probably looking at this from a talent actually mm -hmm. perspective. You know, I just say, hey, what are you, what are you thinking about this? I, you know, I attended this webinar that talked about Web 3.0 and the metaverse. What, you know, are you guys doing anything in this area? Because people are, it's, it's early enough, I think people are willing to share at a certain level. Now, they're always going to be the Apples and the Googles who will share with you things that they did five years ago, not what they're doing right now, <clears throat> but still you can learn from that. And, and that's, you know, that would be my advice is, is this is here, it's coming and mm -hmm. you can either be indifferent to it, which is typically what happens, uh, or, mm -hmm. you know, you can just say, Hey, let's, let me learn some more about this. I mean, just being in this webinar, you've taken that step to, to really ask some of those questions and be exposed to some different viewpoints. And I, I would certainly echo that with all of the clients that I work with, there is a general level of curiosity. I think for a lot of people, there is fear. There is fear of what is this? Will this replace me? There is fear of how far do I go and will people steal my ideas? Um, but I think it's, as you said, David, and this is very, very early yep. in this process. There isn't yet the killer app. This is not yet the standard. So going and simply asking questions of have you heard about what are you thinking about exactly. what is your organization planning with ai or virtual reality or maybe doing simulations of how new employees can get onboarded into the organization or how you can use virtual reality to help potential talent explore the company just having that dialogue I think for a lot of people will be a good step in, in understanding what's possible and kind of asking that that why and exploring where, where are the options. So I think a, a couple of you said that this is not pretty and there's not a framework yet. It's the opportunity to explore the why and be innovative because that's something that we, unlike chat GPT or any other technology today, we can use our years of experience and we can process at a different level. So if we collectively all ask questions, share with each other, challenge each other, bring that learning back, maybe we can build a whole new world where we are the muscles, but the machines are really powering us from underneath. I mean, this has the, the ability to solve some of the world's most pressing problems, you know, whether it's uh, distribution of food or healthcare in a way that typically only gets solved because it has monetary value to the organization. This has a more uh, democratic viewpoint, not democratic in terms of our legal system or our finance system here in the US, but, but the ability for people to come together without the agenda of I can't spend time on this if I can't monetize it in the next 18 months. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, things like diabetes and you know early uh, death of infants and things like that are going to get solved but the risk to that is you don't solve those without getting access to very precious data so there has to be a way to create you know this this separation of personal data with data that you need to solve those difficult problems uh, that's, to me that's the excitement of something like this is it's an opportunity to bring people together not under the auspices of a large you know, software company or, or data service provider but as a, a society that okay. sounds like that will help us cross that digital divide. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions from our participants or from Yvonne or Carol here? Cool. 
Excellent. Well, I believe, Yvonne, you have another program coming up on the 16th on AI. Do you want to take a moment and the opportunity to say a few words about that? Uh, thank you for that, Jennifer. Yes, we do. Uh, this is going to be an in-person event about AI adoption. So learn how chat uh, GPT doll, I think, dash E2, whatever it's called, uh, co-pilot and other generative AI technologies will be used to change our lives. Uh, so it's a continuation um, of the discussion that you had today. And uh, it will be a very interesting one because uh, there are depths to be explored for sure. <laughs> I'm sure to that. So I wanted to take the opportunity as well to uh, thank our panelists and uh, Jennifer um, and uh, a wonderful discussion, a very uh, uh, informative and uh, can't, I, I'm not a big fan of the metaverse, but you know, it is it is what it is. It's coming, as you said. So there's not much we can do but uh, inform ourselves and uh, hope for the best. <laughs> um, I appreciate all of you. Thank you for all the, uh, the, um, the attendees who joined us today. Uh, there will be a recording of the event, so feel free to share with any person that you think would um, uh, benefit from this. And um, until then, it was a pleasure seeing you all and uh, have Absolutely. a wonderful day a wonderful day thank, thank you, you everyone thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.